This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Hello, my name is Jacinta Thompson and I'm the Executive Director and Events and Exhibitions Producer of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. I would like to acknowledge that the University of South Australia meets on the land of the Kaurna people. We wish to express our respect for the Kaurna people, their elders and ancestors, and acknowledge the spiritual and cultural relationship the Kaurna people have with their traditional land. I extend that respect to Aboriginal peoples from other areas of South Australia and Australia. I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the Hawke Centre and the University of South Australia to our online presentation with Professor Cassandra Zerke. Following her presentation, Cassandra will be in conversation with Professor Susan Hillier, Dean of Research, Allied Health and Human Performance at UniSA, as they discuss Cassandra's latest book, Secrets of Women's Healthy Aging, Living Better, Living Longer. I would also like to thank the publisher, Melbourne University Press, for their ongoing commitment to supporting a vast array of outstanding Australian writers. Professor Cassandra Zerke is Principal Investigator of the Women's Healthy Aging Project, the longest ongoing study of women's health in Australia. She is a general physician and consultant neurologist and multi-award winning clinical researcher she has published more than 200 publications and has held many significant academic positions. Cassandra is currently Director of the Healthy Aging Program in the Centre for Medical Research and Professor of Medicine in the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences at the University of Melbourne. Recognised internationally for her contributions to healthy aging research, she holds the Australian clinical representative role in the Worldwide Alzheimer's Disease Initiative, The Global Burden of Dementia, and is Chief Medical Officer for the Australian Health and Aging Organisation. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Professor Cassandra Serki. Thank you. Thanks so much for that introduction. And it's a real pleasure to be here today to talk to you about the secrets of women's healthy ageing. Really, the talk I'm going to give today comes from three decades of research at the University of Melbourne as part of the Healthy Ageing Program. And one of our longest running studies, and in fact, the longest running study of women's health in Australia, is the Women's Healthy Ageing Project. And this project has been a huge influence internationally in women's health and also um, what I'll be talking about today. So I've got an overview of what I'll be speaking about and I'm going to touch on these things really briefly so that we get lots of time to, uh, time to talk together and for me to answer your questions. So I'll start with why beyond bikini health. I'll talk about living longer and living better and then I'll talk about living younger. I'll touch on brain and mood because of course I'm a neurologist and so this is one of my favourite areas to talk about and then I'll talk a little bit about the future and future health. So to start with bikini health, you know, as a neurologist, when I get invited to talk about women's health, um, sometimes people are a little shocked when I start talking about the brain and the heart. But in fact, if you look at the leading causes of death in Australia, and these are Australian Bureau statistics and the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare statistics, you can see that in fact, the leading causes of death in our country are heart disease, dementia and stroke also called cerebrovascular disease. And that's actually a disease involving the blood vessels that go to the brain. So heart and brain are the leading cause of death in our country. And if you move to see the little right-hand side chart of the man and the woman there, in fact, in women, the leading cause of death in this country for women is dementia. Second leading cause of death being heart disease followed by stroke. 
The other interesting chart is on the left-hand side with the lines. And what this is showing is if you look at the blue line, these are deaths from heart disease over all the years. And you can see that heart disease deaths are actually declining in our population, which is great. You can see that stroke, which is the orange line, deaths from stroke are declining. Um, malignant or cancer, um, which is the aqua line, is declining. And respiratory diseases deaths are kind of stable. There's one line on that chart that's going up. And unfortunately, that's deaths from dementia. So really, dementia is the one disease that is not declining despite our amazing um, you know, medical progress. It's in fact increasing. So it's something we really do have to be concerned about, particularly as women, given it's the leading cause of death in women. And in fact, two thirds of all cases of dementia, not just in our country, but globally are women. So there's a heart-brain connection. And this is a book chapter that I wrote at the turn of the century, actually, um, which we really discuss that overlap and how the blood vessel is so crucial for brain health. And what used to be called vascular dementia and Alzheimer's dementia is different dementias. In fact, there's a big overlap in vascular damage in Alzheimer's brains. And there's also a Spanish version of the book if you'd like to read it in Spanish. So moving on to living longer and living better then from that introduction, what we really think about with brain and heart is what we call a therapeutic window. So there's a normal coronary artery at the top. Then there's that atherosclerosis or the clogging that can happen in arteries, which produces blood flow. And then for something like a stroke or a heart attack, you can get a clot, which actually stops blood flow going to the brain for stroke or to the heart um, for heart disease. That process there, that takes decades. It doesn't happen overnight. It actually takes decades. And when we think about a brain, that's a healthy brain I'm showing you there on the left and a brain of someone with severe Alzheimer's disease on the right. So that level of shrinkage, cell loss and cell death, again, that doesn't happen overnight. In fact, for dementia, we think it takes three decades for that process to happen. So you can see with decades of disease evolution, that's why with our rising aging population, we're starting to see diseases that we didn't see as much when we were younger. This is another chart from um, the Australian Bureau, which was put in the Australian Institute Family um, Studies report. And this shows in the 1900s, the distribution of people aged from zero to 85 plus. And you can see they're just all the people and then again, 1961, the year 2000, and the predictions, this report was done 10 years ago, the predictions of what um, we're going to have in 2050. And really the point of this is to look at these age ranges above 50 and just see how few people in our population were living over 50 um, just 100 years ago and just 50 years ago. Whereas now and into the future, we're looking at having actually quite a large proportion of our population living over 50. Moving to the table on the right, you can see this is statistics on how many people get Alzheimer's disease. And you can see the prevalence um, of disease in the 60 to 64 group is only about 1%. But five years later, it's double that at 2%. Five years later, double that at 4% and so on and so forth. So these early statistics actually really scared everyone because with this growth of the older population and the connection between so-called age and these chronic diseases of aging like heart disease, dementia and stroke, there was a lot of concern that a large proportion of people would be getting these diseases because of their age. We have also published, and this was just published in 2019, with a big global international group um, about the global number of cases of dementia. And the number of dementia cases has doubled in the last 25 years. So again, we are seeing that this is an issue. We are getting more Alzheimer's deaths. However, and I've put this up because it's got my favorite title of every paper. <laughs> it says dementia is not inevitable. And so what we know is that in studies and the Nordic countries are really good at doing these kind of centenarian studies. And this one's from Denmark. Um, in people who have reached a hundred, 
where we would expect by that doubling in percentage that we'd have a lot of people um, who would have dementia. In fact, that's not the case. So it's showing us that age is not necessarily a marker of disease. It's not the number of years you're on the planet. It's really the number of years you might be exposed to a risk factor. So a lot of the centenarians got to be centenarians because they had less risk factors. And so when you look at the proportion of people with dementia who are centenarians, it's much less than you would expect from that scary table I showed you before. So it's not inevitable and it can be prevented. And really that's why we're doing this sort of work. So what do we do to live younger and not to get the chronic diseases of aging, dementia, heart disease, stroke? So something that's important is nutrition. And I've shown you this chart in my talk because they didn't let me put it in my book because it was too complicated. Um, and what I love about this chart is, you know, I'm sure you've heard of all the diets. There's a DASH diet that's good for health, Mediterranean diet, good for health. There's so many different diets you can grab that are good for health. What we did here is we mapped several of these diets together on this radar chart. And what you can see from this, each diet is a different colored line. And you can see that there's a huge degree of overlap. So in fact, whether you're on one diet or the other, you're actually eating a lot of very, very similar things. But the diets that are not good for you, they have high levels of processed meat, which you can see on this chart by that large spike here, high processed meats, Another spike here with another bad diet, the junk food diet, is added sugar, confectionery here, cakes, biscuits, sweet foods. So you can see that the bad diets are having spikes, fried fish, fried potatoes, processed meats, sugars. So if you can avoid sugar and fried foods, you're going a long way to not being in the bad diet category and remember processed meats have a lot of added sugar and fat so this could be why it's pinging so high at processed meats changing tack and looking at the good diets so here we've got the green diets um, you can see here that leafy vegetables vegetables and fruit are where they really differ from the other diets a lot of the rest is an overlap but you can see a ping on fish that's not fried you can see a ping on nuts and the vegetables. So focusing on vegetables and avoiding sugars and fried foods is a good way to have a healthy um, eating habit. The other thing I thought I'd talk about is sunshine. So we were really interested in vitamin D and brain health. And we actually did a review of all the research in the world and show that really it looks like vitamin D is really important for our brain health. Not only did it show that people who had good levels of vitamin D who were not deficient, they had less cognitive decline as they got older, but also less likely to have a diagnosis of dementia. And um, I put up this uh, editorial that was done on our study because they called it vitam vitamin D dementia, which I thought was a cute little um, acronym. And this was um, the paper we did after that review. So having looked at that, we looked in our own cohort of Australian women. And what we found was the women here, you can see here the um, vitamin D levels that were low. This is um, defined as low by clinical guidelines. They had a full standard deviation, um, cognitive testing lower than the other women who are other levels of healthy vitamin D but there's no, no benefit to being super good in your vitamin D because as you can see, everyone with a good level of vitamin D had a good level of their cognitive testing. So, you know, nutrition is not just important for brain health and heart health, which we all know it's good for heart health. It can also alleviate symptoms of depression. So, you know, this, this is a, a neat little chart put out by the Australian guidelines and it shows you that 13 to 90% um, of mild cognitive impairment could be reduced if you have a Mediterranean diet and 19 to 26% lower odds of Alzheimer's disease, but also that 85% of studies looking at Mediterranean diet showed you could um, alleviate depressive symptoms. So the second thing I would talk about is activity. Now we all know that activity is very important for heart health because we've been told that for years. But we've done some really interesting work showing it is potentially the big key to preventing dementia. And this was the World Economic Forum that actually wrote up a big 
um, paper on our study saying it may well be key, particularly when you look at the length of our study of 30 years. So with exercise or just any activity, we really found across 30 years, whilst there were several risk factors that were important, it was the most important for your cognitive health. This is a paper we just released this year. So this is just this year. And what was interesting about this uh, is that we looked at those people who had a genetic risk of getting dementia. So those with the APOE4 genotype. And we found in people with the APOE4 genotype, which makes them more likely to get those amyloid deposits in their brain, people who had a better timed up and go test, which literally means just getting up out of a chair and walking. If you were better at doing that, you are less likely to have that amyloid in your brain. So, you know, sometimes people worry about how much exercise they have to do. But this study showed that just your time getting up out of a chair and walking a few steps was significant in reducing those levels of amyloid in your brain. And then I also put up this one um, along the same lines. We did this big review with a number of colleagues internationally. And we looked not just at physical activity, but what we call sedentary behaviour or sitting around. And this study showed that in fact, if you could just reduce your time sitting around, you'd have better global cognitive function. So if you can't get out there and exercise, just try and sit less and that's also good for you. So in our big study that looked across 30 years and looked at all the risk factors in women in Australia, we really found, as I said, that physical activity was the most important. So for every level of physical activity, a woman had less in our study, she lost a word of her word test recall. So just say you're going shopping and um, you've got a shopping list of things. So if you drop a level of physical activity, you might forget to bring something home. So this is significant. But we also saw that high blood pressure and in terms of lipids or cholesterols, there's several of them. Most people know all about cholesterol and that's a bad, a bad sort of lipid. And low density lipoprotein, LDL is another bad lipid. You don't want those levels to be high. But there's a lipid called high density lipoprotein and that's actually uh, the good cholesterol. And we found in our study that good cholesterol was absolutely the most important in terms of protecting women's cognitive health. So um, I love putting up this editorial because they actually reanalyzed our data and they said that they saw from our study that the physical activity and well-controlled blood pressure could actually compensate for the negative impacts of aging. So this is getting to that dementia is not inevitable. And given it's a leading cause of death in women in our country and the UK, this is important. Uh, this is a bit scary, this paper we published but um, I said blood pressure was important and so we only looked at what's called pre-hypertension so that means you don't have high blood pressure yet but your blood pressure is maybe a little bit higher than it should be and we did in fact find across 20 years the people who had high blood pressure but not too high um, did have worse cognition a decade later so you know getting onto that blood pressure measurement and um, reducing blood pressure is really important for your healthy aging. So just dot points because I know I don't have that much time. Get physical activity, get some sunlight for your vitamin D while still being sun smart. Really the best diet is the non-Western diet, but really eat fresh fruit and veg, avoid sugar and processed fats. Watch your blood pressure and lipids with your GP and social engagement is also really important. So I thought I'd lean on and talk about mood and the brain and mental health overlap because obviously it's the one organ. There's a lot of interconnection between psychiatry and neurology. We did this study looking at depression and cognition and looking at the interaction between these two with those amyloid levels in the brain. And there is a relationship with depression, cognition and those amyloid. Um, loads and this is quite recently published research so there really is an interaction there which is important to look at and I thought I'd mention something to everyone which is called pseudo dementia so dementia is a terminal disease um, it is a disease that by definition means you've lost functional capacity 
Yet there's something called pseudodementia that is not a terminal disease, but its symptoms are so severe, it's like you have dementia. There's that degree of loss of function, but actually it is a mental health cause of those symptoms and so reversible. So it just goes to show how significant that overlap can be. We know a lot about um, social engagement and how good it is for humans. I wanted to relate it directly to what I've been telling you guys about. So in um, big studies around the world, they've shown that if you exercise with other people, you do better than if you exercise alone. And there's a great study actually that's called the Wheeze Have It. <laughs> so doing things with other can actually enhance the benefits even more. And we also know that even in young people, just stress can affect academic behaviour and then therefore cognitive performance. So if we look at what I've said so far, which is activity, diet and vascular risk factors and seeing GP to make sure you're healthy, there might be this whole other bit of the iceberg around society, community and engagement that's also impacting our health quite considerably. So I already mentioned the Mediterranean diet can actually um, impact on depression. And we did a big review recently, um, just a couple of years ago, looking at this and showing that um, really modifying diet could be a potential treatment to reduce the increasing rates of um, depression we're seeing globally. Um, one of the issues with Mediterranean diet or really any diet is how can researchers control what you're eating and we can't <laughs> so one of the interesting things when you get into diet is seeing that Mediterranean diet works best for people in the Mediterranean so they have the greatest benefit with less heart disease and less um, cognitive impairment and dementia diagnoses however Mediterranean people who move to other countries while still eating Mediterranean diet do not have as much as a benefit and people who eat Mediterranean diet who are not Mediterranean have even less benefit. So this was fascinating to me. And I put up this slide where I think, well, this is the way Mediterranean people eat their Mediterranean diets. And perhaps this is the way some Australians with the Mediterranean pizza there <laughs> eat their Mediterranean diets. And so maybe there's something about how we eat and how we engage when we eat, which is actually contributing to these strong results we see in terms of diet being so beneficial for us. So I thought I would end now just talking a little bit about the future. And of course, there is so much we don't know. And going back to those initial charts I showed you, where we can see that the population's aging and we just didn't have research on people over 50. Um, in the 1900s, people only lived to 50. So we don't know much about that last part of health. And particularly in women's health, the mean age of menopause is 50. So now we're living a third of our lives in postmenopause, whereas in the 1900s, you might not have lived much at all in menopause because the mean age of death was around the time of final menstrual period. So there's a lot we need to know that we just don't know because we haven't had an older population. So it's really important to do research in this sort of space. And particularly now we know it's two decades and three decades for dementia, these diseases develop. You need studies that go for two or three decades. You can't possibly see what's happening when to cause those diseases. In terms of future, I really wanted to focus, because I don't have much time, on how the participants of our research have really made such valuable contributions. So some time ago, when we were doing um, around 2000, we were interviewing participants. So that's, uh, oh my goodness, two decades ago now. Um, they said to us, why aren't you asking us about our grandchildren? <laughs> and so we thought, oh, okay, well, if you'd like us to, we'll do that. And so we started asking them about their grandparenting in the year 2000, 2002, 2004, 2012, 14. And then we started publishing on this data. And what we found was that grandparenting actually had significant impacts on people's later life cognitive health and people who were grandparenting actually had better cognitive health and what was interesting just in terms of the field of research around the world is when we first started our publication as all good researchers do we looked at globally the literature and what we found is from 1983 through to 2014 when we were writing our first paper only 14 papers had been published on grandparenting and cognition. And some of these were not really relevant exactly to grandparenting and cognition, but in the search, we found 14 papers. However, after publishing our 2014 papers, 
there were 27 papers just in the next five years. So it showed actually people hadn't thought about this. And it was the women in our study who said, hey, why aren't you asking me? It's a really important part of my life that actually started this, not just in Australia, this is across the world. And, you know, Fox News took this up and China Daily. And there's been actually a lot of the research has been done in China um, since our publication on grandparenting and cognition. So it just shows that um, we really got to get people involved in research um, because uh, they, they know what's most important really for their health. And that's where I was going to end um, and just talk about our new study, Age Happy, which is based on the study that I've just been talking about, the Healthy Aging Project. Um, but we've actually put it online. So this means you can do it from the comfort of your own home. You don't have to come in. And we're hoping also through this to get out to more regional areas because a lot of the research, um, as you know, is done you know, in capital cities where people come in and get assessments. So um, I'm hoping everyone will join. Um, if you'd like further information, I've also put into my slides um, a link to our Healthy Aging Program. So you can look up all our research papers and look at what some of the wonderful early career researchers are doing. Um, in terms of dementia, because I am a neurologist and so many people might be interested in that, there's some um, really good publications from the International Alzheimer's Association, which showcase the work that we've done so far. And also this brilliant paper just published this year, which summarises all the work of um, the important work in dementia in Australia. And obviously some of our stuff is also in there, but also everything that was done in Australia, really good publication to look at if you wanna know what's going on in dementia research in Australia. I've popped in here a good article about brain health. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. Really happy to take questions and chat to you guys. Thanks so much, Cassandra. That was just absolutely fascinating. And I, I'm sure the audience will agree with me that uh, we could have listened to you for several more hours. I'm really, uh, delighted to be able to um, share some of the questions that were pre-submitted with you um, so that we can uh, investigate a few of the, the points that you were making. Um, and I think you've already summed up for us really nicely that uh, there was a whole lot of questions uh, and I, I thank the audience for uh, already participating around this idea of, you know, the, the top tips for us. And I think you've, you, you've really summarize that in some of your slides um, so one of the questions was what are one or two non-negotiable self-help self-care or health tips that we really couldn't go without we shouldn't go without so I think actually the number one tip I didn't even talk about the number one tip I would say for women's health is for us to think about our health you know, our to-do lists are incredibly long for everyone in this world, <laughs> added to with all the additional things we're coping with at the moment, but we just don't put our health on that list. I mean, look, if we break our leg, we're going to go to the doctor, but preventive health, our health 10, 20, 30 years for dementia into the future is something we don't think about every day. And I think if you just think about your health every day, and you know, that's why in my book, I actually have, the, there's some great research around the world, you know, mm. one saying 15 minutes of exercise a day buys you three extra years, 20 minutes of, of exercise every day buys you seven years. So, you know, just thinking about your health every day, because mm -hmm. you think you don't have time, but actually being healthy will buy you time, not just time on the planet, mm -hmm. but time functionally able and happy on the planet. Great. Well, that kind of leads to another question. Someone was saying, is it, when is, is it too late? You know, like if I'm over 60, for example, let's just say I'm not over 60. This isn't my question. Uh, but somebody <laughs> was over 60. Is it too late to start thinking about your health then? When this should is a we great start? question. It's a great question. It's a question I asked when I first came into the study. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> um, what we hypothesised, because most of the work out there shows you midlife risk factor gives you better later life health so there's a lot of work saying oh my god we really have to target in midlife because that's the time because of this delay of 10 20 years later you're getting disease so that was our hypothesis we went in we had 30 years of data we said right we know that what people do in midlife is going to be the most important let's check it and we were proven wrong 
we were proven wrong. So in fact, in our analysis, what we found in these Australian women across 30 years was the effect was cumulative, which is a statistical term. <laughs> what it means is what you did each and every day summed up over those 30 years was what mattered. So if you did a little bit here, but then you did more there and you had the same number as someone else who was the same amount the whole way along, you were still just as good as them. So it's actually what you do each and every day over those 30 years. Now, you know, our study goes from 40s to 80s. So we don't know yet 80s to 100. That's the next 10 years, 20 years yeah, of our study. Yeah. <laughs> but certainly up to 80, it looks like each and every day what you do matters. And so with cumulative, you can make up for lost time. And that's the take. Ah, you can make up for lost time. Right. However, I highly recommend you start today because if yeah. you don't do it today, you have to do twice as much tomorrow. So start today, <laughs> start today. Right. So on that note, somebody also asked, is to what extent um, does it matter what happens in your early life? Like, you know, so early life as a baby or a toddler or a teenager, I know some of our researchers here are even looking at, you know, fetal health and its impact later. So what would what would be your advice, you know, for our children? That what, what do we say to our daughters, uh, our granddaughters? So, you know, the answer to this is a, our lecture in itself. Yes, yes. <laughs> but, you, you know, spot on, spot on question. In fact, everything from the time the sperm hits the egg and actually even before determines your health, both genetically, but also the environment in which that is growing all the way through our lives. So in fact, it's really important. The second important thing is <laughs> that we now know that the kind of habits we form when we're younger, they persist for our lives. And so that's why we've been having such a big public health focus on nutrition and activity as a health focus in schools, rather than that subject no one wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. I did not like doing PE, let's just, just say, that's great. Okay, you've touched on this already in, in the talk around, uh, you know, social engagement. And a lot of um, our pre-submitted um, questions were around this idea of connection and connectivity. Um, and people were asking about this, this idea of um, how do we, how, what, what kind of events and what kind of activities can we do um, that are available um, particularly when there's a financial cost um, to mm. increase this kind of connectivity. Yeah, so I think connectivity means being with other people in the way you like to be with other people. Right. So uh -huh. this is not extrovert, introvert. That is not the case at all. Right. So introverts might not want to be in social situations, but they have their own connections with people in their way. And so it's about not feeling alone. That's what it's about. Um, so people can be alone, but they don't feel alone. And that's great. <laughs> it's like you don't have to be around other people. No, no, no. It's about connections, yeah. about social engagement connections. And, you know, in the chapter where I discuss connections, I've got a variety of examples. And I actually even um, have little anecdotes um, from the women around, uh, you know, one of them who, who is not someone who likes to be around people, but who talks about how they joined a club just to give their... Um, accounting capacity they were headhunted because they knew the books and so they came along and they you know there was a part of that social connection that was important to them even though they didn't attend functions and events um, so connection is more than just attending things and you know the question on money and finance huh, you know um, I don't want to say that money doesn't buy happiness or that money doesn't buy health because you know oh gosh money buys a lot <laughs> um, but the truth is you don't need to have money to have purpose in life and you don't need to have money to have connections mm -hmm. and so you know that's the focus right some I people think, yeah. would say sometimes money is a is a barrier to mm -hmm. both of those things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah there was another question about um, close companionship versus an intimate partner and I think you've actually answered that it's about the, the the quality of the engagement and and your feelings of would you agree that the, if if having close friends helps you to to feel connected that's as important as having a, a partner in the in your house so to speak oh yes yeah. so there's no yeah. necessity for a partner yes. and in fact yeah. uh, we actually did a study i didn't put it in this book yeah. um there's too much to put in <laughs> just one book <laughs> we did a study looking at intimate relationships so we looked at marriage 
-hmm. We looked at people who are married, people who are unmarried, and we took a gender lens to that. Mm -hmm. So married men have better health than unmarried men. Mm -hmm. Married women, not so much. <laughs> and there is not enough research mm -hmm. done in non-heterosexual relationships because most of the research is done heterosexual relationships. But the small amount done in non-heterosexual relationships shows that it's not the same in non-heterosexual relationships. So there's mm -hmm. something about, it's got nothing to do with uh, male-female sex, but something to do with our cultural identities and roles that mean, you know, married women do not have the same advantage as married men. It's about the nature of the relationship and having a good social connection, which is important for our health. Great. That's, that's really, really reassuring. That question came up a little, a fair bit. Um, let's move on to some of the, you talked about um, activity, and I really liked that it's, uh, it's not, it's about the physical activity that that works for you. So someone was asking, if it is what we do every day that counts, and you've just clarified that, how do you work out what's best for you as an individual um, in terms of what, what, how do you work out what suits you in terms of your underlying conditions, your different, um, you know, base levels of activity? What sort of guidance can you give people in that decision making? Okay, so there's two parts I want to answer that question. Mm -hmm. So the first is, you know, you're absolutely spot on that there's no one size fits all. And maybe mm -hmm. this is why I know, you know, governments around the world, I'm sure are very irritated that we are not complying with the physical activity guidelines. But, you know, I think one of the problems are they're not even done by sex. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's very different what, you know, there are gender differences in what we like to do as activity um, and whether um, it's social activity or goal-directed activity. And there's a lot of research on this. I think we need to tailor our advice more for individuals. Mm -hmm. And so what I would recommend to the person asking that specific question is general practitioners are superb and they're your guide in life. And they know all your medical conditions as well as what you're telling them you'd like to do as activity. And together you guys can come up with tailored activity just for you. And probably there's no other program that can do that, that at this moment, although we're going to get there, <laughs> um, you know, a tailored program just for you that doesn't have to stay the same. And I talk mm -hmm. about this in the book, that as you um, go through life across 30 years, people change their activity. There's things they like to do, things they want to do, things they have to do, and these things change over time and that's all okay. Yeah. And then the second part is another confession that our hypothesis was wrong again was that when we looked at our analyses, we were expecting people with intense exercise to do better than people who walked around the block. And that's because there's so much research out there talking about high intensity activity. And it's absolutely true that in studies, 12 weeks, three months, one year, people who do intense activity, those blood cholesterols come down, the blood sugars drop. You can see you know, blood vessel growth more in the high intense um, exercises. So that's why we thought this. But when you look over 30 years, mm -hmm. in fact, it was not the intense exercises who did best. It was people who took a walk, but each and every day for an hour, seven days a week. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's that building into your life, isn't it? It's the sort of not taking the car to the shops and the... And that's why I put up that yeah. picture of the brain yeah. and the blood vessels. These things yeah. take two decades to three decades to yeah. develop. So, you know, being an intense exerciser for a couple of years or 10 years even yeah. Yeah. doesn't have an impact on a 30-year disease that's trying to develop. Yeah. We have to do something for 30 years. So for goodness, do something you love and do it every day. Yes, yeah. And do you find that people don't necessarily give themselves the credit uh, for, you know, that they might not realise that maybe an hour out in the garden every day, they don't actually think is important, but actually it is important. It, it, did that come up in your study, this sort of people downplaying what they did? I Absolutely. But I also think when we look at studies and, you know, I'm an epidemiologist, which now everyone knows what that is, but, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, we got to be honest, in medicine, the kind of level A evidence is the randomised control double blind trial. So when you're doing a randomised double blind control trial, you're not getting people to garden or not garden because you couldn't possibly blind them to whether they're gardening or not. Yeah. And so we don't have much knowledge on these sorts of activities. What this study, being an epidemiological study and just observing people for 30 years, we were able to record people who are intense exercises, we were able to record people who were doing gardening and vacuuming. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it was that cumulative time doing activities that was the most important. Great. That's 
think that's really reassuring, isn't it? People can actually feel more positive about how they're spending their day, given that they're not maybe going to the gym. Um, there are quite a few very specific questions, Cassandra, about, about health issues. Well, um, has your research given you any insights into how to have a healthy gut? Um, there's been a lot of talk in the media, hasn't there, about, you know, the gut environment and all those sorts of things. So particularly for women over 50, what should they be focused on, focusing on for a healthy gut? Yeah, so, so gut health is really important. Mm -hmm. Think of it as, um, it's not a very female analogy, but we're a car, right? Mm -hmm. So put in premium fuel, you know, mm -hmm. don't go for that, you know, really cheap, cheap fuel. Go for premium for fuel, mm -hmm. not just because you want your car to go well, but for us, we want to live to 100. We're going to live to 100 now. We're, mm -hmm. we're living to 87 in this country, I think. So, you know, when you're using your car for 87 years and you can't just trade it in for a new model, mm. you really do want to be using premium fuel every day. Yeah. Gut health is really important, not just because the gut is providing all the nutrients every one of your organs needs, including the brain, including the heart, but also it has an entire function on metabolizing and removing some of the things we don't need and it has an anti-inflammatory role in our bodies mm -hmm. now one of the things about aging diseases we thought were aging but centenarians are teaching us are not aging <laughs> they're simply a reflection of exposure to mm -hmm. risk yeah one of those exposures to risk is the more inflammation you have over time the more likely you are to get heart disease dementia stroke osteoarthritis, osteoporosis. Inflammation is being a core part of progressing uh -huh. these diseases if you have them and being more likely to get them. And, you know, the gut has a role in being anti-inflammatory. And so the answer is the green leafy vegetables. Right. Vegetables, and vegetables, vegetables. Yeah, because that yeah. actually grows. You know, you, you probably have heard of um, microbiome. It's the little mm -hmm. bugs that actually live inside our gut. And feeding them vegetables makes them happy. Fresh, roasted. Fresh. Oh, unprocessed. Everything unprocessed. unprocessed. Remember, okay. processed foods were a big ping. Yes. Having said that, of course, so-called natural, you know, sauerkraut and some of those um, kim quinoa, you know, some of the, the processed food, unprocessed foods, but preserved foods yeah. actually really do help the gut health as well. Right. Great. Okay. Well, a little bit allied to that. Somebody also said that they've noticed as they get older that they're taking longer to recover from colds and other things like this. So um, and do you have any tips on how do you boost your immunity? Oh, look, right now, of course, we all need to boost <laughs> exactly. our immunity. Yeah. So what I would say is throughout the book, all of the chapters actually boost immunity. And I actually have a section where I talk about immunity. So okay. vitamin D boosts immunity. Right. That was really interesting. So, yep. you know, it's, it's important for brain health. It's important for bone health. <laughs> it actually also boosts immunity. Yeah. And the other problem is sometimes when we look at supplement data, now vitamin C supplements do actually, you know, improve immunity. Mm -hmm. However, when we looked at vitamin D supplementation and there's been a Cochrane review looking at vitamin D tablet supplementation, mm -hmm. we don't see the impact we do when we observe people with high vitamin D. Uh -huh. So there's something going funny there that you can't just take it as a tablet. Right. So, and of course, that sun reaction in our skin that creates the vitamin D for us yes, is a yeah. chemical reaction. So, there's some suggestion around the need for that chemical reaction to occur to have the anti inflammatory effects right. um, that we see with some of the brain diseases that are associated with vitamin D. Right. So, you know, getting your vitamins, vitamin C, E, and D is important. Again, vegetables and fruit mm -hmm. are a good way to up your immunity. And to be honest, something people don't think of sleep yeah. you know the more you sleep actually it yeah. does improve your immune system and sleep deprivation is awful for your immune system so right now with all we're dealing with i mean obviously get vaccinated and then make sure you've got a good night's rest and you're eating healthy great okay so with the vitamin d stuff do you think that that interaction with sunlight i know there's some research around being in you know um being in nature being outside uh you know being in green environments is there some connection do you think with that with that sort of uh you know the research that people are looking at now that physical activity is great physical activity in a, in a natural environment is even better so you know that's very early work and the main right. vitamin d studies they've often studied again in metropolitan areas uh-huh and they do do we do a um 
uh, correction measure based on your geographic latitude and longitude and seasonal variation right, for right. sun, vitamin D. But most of the research is still metro and not all cities are beautiful and green like Melbourne. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Adelaide. Yeah, we're lucky. We're very lucky with our parks here. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? So there is a bit of a trade-off here, isn't there, between uh, you know sun protection and exposure to the sun for people. Yeah, so what's important in our country? And look, to be honest, we actually have quite high levels of vitamin D deficiency because yes. you know we know how sun smart we have to be. Yeah. Um, however, you only need 30 minutes of your forearms out in the sun. And uh -huh. you can even do 10 minutes of forearm exposure, both forearms, every day will give you enough vitamin D. The uh -huh. other thing is, you know, try to avoid that high UV <laughs> exposure time. Yeah. So you can yeah. go out in the morning and have your coffee or tea or in the afternoons outside those high, high sun exposure times. Right. You see um, the application of sunscreen uh, stops that chemical reaction from occurring. So. Right. Yeah. Okay. Great tips. They're really, really helpful. I'm sure everybody's busy taking notes. Well, now that we're recording this, of course, they can listen again. Uh, and uh, quite a few of the pre the pre uh, questions have come from people who've been listening to your podcast. So that's a, that's a really good plug that people are uh, already accessing information. Um, there's a very great question here about the healthy aging of women in diverse groups. So uh, you've already mentioned that often we're very metro centric um, and uh, you know that what have, what are you coming up with in terms of less less sort of traditional groups as it were so indigenous or you know different religious groups or yeah so i would say this is an incredibly important question yeah i feel like because although i'm virtual i'm virtually in the hawk center so i reckon i can be a little political please <laughs> please at, do at my please own do. at my own enormous risk um yeah. It is a really important question. America does it really well. They've been mm -hmm. really good at funding multicultural research. Um, about five, 10 years ago, oh my God, I'm getting old, 10 years ago, <laughs> we actually have been trying to find what we're calling McWAP, McDonald's ah. Sumi, <laughs> which is multicultural WAP. And you, know, you really do need to fund this work because obviously studies are open, but you need, our, all our studies are in English. You really yeah. need funding to tailor for communities, to provide access, also to get them involved in what they want to know. Like there's a whole field out there of what's important. And so, and we have been going for funding for the last decade and we did get really close. We went for a centre of healthy ageing, which incorporated this nationally. Um, and we got to interview at NHMRC in Canberra. Um, which, you know, you know what this means, Susan, you know, you're right up there. <laughs> but they could, they interviewed six and they only had money for three. And, you know, so we're really trying. We're really trying because, unfortunately, this really does need a big amount of investment because it's not just, you know, cookie-cuttering it in a different way. You really need community involvement and um, uh, translations, no mean feet in Australia, which is wonderful because there's lots of languages and so we're really trying to do that what we have done um you know just as a university on on the thin air that we breathe <laughs> mm. is this age happy study where yeah. by being on the internet it really allows everyone to be able to join there's no exclusions i mean you know every study's got exclusion criteria mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no exclusion criteria oh, fantastic. yes fantastic. no exclusion yeah every australian adult can join and of course it does it's still in english yeah. Um, but you can get someone to help you yeah. who might be able to translate. So, so that's what I've done at this stage while I continue to bang away to, to get exactly that funded. It's a great question and so important. The yeah. research, I told you America's done a really good job on this. And if they've taught us anything, they've taught us there is huge differences. Yeah. If you don't look at this, you will not be serving everyone. So it's a really important yeah. question. I think it's, uh, it's something that's been really highlighted, hasn't it, with the pandemic is the need for us that, you know, it's not a one size fits all around health services, around health messaging, uh, about listening to people and how we message. So I think it's uh, it's very humbling, actually, isn't it, when we realise how wrong we can get it when we assume that everybody is the same. Mm. That's great. Now, there was a, a whole raft of questions, I'd have to say. We might have a, a bit of a, a bit of a deep dive into hormones. Um, so clearly, uh, you know, hormones for women's health are very much on mind. And as we age, 
uh, and as menopause hits. So a lot of questions, for example, around HRT um, and, uh, you know, what are, what's the current state of play? Knowing that you can't, you know, you can only give very general answers, but what's the current thinking? You know, are we scared of HRT? Do we love HRT? <laughs> Is it a little bit more nuanced than that? It's nuanced. So I've got a whole chapter just on hormones in the book uh -huh. Uh -huh. because I just thought this was so important to discuss. Yeah. Having said that, there's a lot we don't know. Mm. So it's going to be really hard to summarise it. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so please get your hands on that chapter. It, it kind of talks about everything. Yeah. But to cut a long story short, I think what you said is, are we scared of hormones? And I think um, we are scared of hormones. And there's a reason for that. We all know why we're scared. Because the Women's Health Initiative study said, oh, my God, don't take them. It doesn't give you better, um, less heart disease. It doesn't give you less dementia. It does give you less fractures, <laughs> but it increases your risk of breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And because of that, in the year 2002, if I'm not mistaken, um, over the next five years, I think 80% of prescriptions disappeared. Wow. So 80% of women taking hormones at that time stopped taking them. And what happened? They stopped taking them. Oh, there's some good anecdotes I've got in my book about what happened. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, but the point is, when you look at that study, because it really was that one study that did this, it was very strong and powerful because it was a wonderful study. Oh, it was huge, tens of thousands of women, um, and it cost millions of dollars to do this study. So to do it again would be almost impossible. The mean age of those women was 63. So I told you before, the mean age of menopause is 50. So these women were a mean 13 years after their final menstrual period, and they were now getting reintroduced estrogen. So I think we should be scared of reintroducing estrogen when we're a decade after our menopause. I think mm -hmm. that is not a good idea, and we're right to be very nervous about doing that. The question that remains unanswered is that if we maintain our estrogen levels around the mean age of men from 45 to 55, if we keep maintaining those, is that going to improve our health? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the question of our generation. Although, to be honest, we were asking this in 2002. But mm -hmm. <laughs> that aside, um, five, oh no, eight years ago now, they actually started some studies in the USA and they took women at the time of menopause and they used um, hormone therapy. And what they did was they measured these vessels. You've got two major blood vessels going up to the brain, very important. And they measured how um, much atherosclerosis was in them. They measured the flow. And they found, and it was published in New England Journal of Medicine, so you can find it easily. Um, they found that women who were taking the hormone replacement therapy, this is randomized control, double blind, level A evidence, they had better flow in these blood vessels than women who were not taking the hormone therapy. So that's where we're at. We're mm -hmm. five to eight years. And you know, the next question is, but what about 10 years later? What about breast cancer? And also some people were arguing, well, just because you got better flow, does that mean you'll ever get a stroke or dementia? Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. you know, so so disease takes 30 years to develop. So it's that's where we're at. Okay. These are questions that should be asked. And, um, you know, some of the work we're now doing, because we do have 30 years of data, is to look at that. Uh -huh. But it's not going to be a randomised double blind control trial. To do that, you'd need 30 years. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. So it's highly individual is what I'm hearing. And uh, are you suggesting a conversation with your GP about your oh, concerns? Oh, definitely. Yeah. So I think that, uh, number one, as I said, you'd need to be around the time of menopause. Right. So okay. if you're way remote to menopause, I think we have established yep. that if you've washed all the hormones out of your system, you're down to a non-estrogen and your yep. body has re-equilibriated in that environment, yep. reintroducing estrogen gives you more problems than benefit. Okay. So manage. But if you're yep. at the time, yep. around the time of menopause, this is a conversation with GP yeah. because, of course, there's all other factors. Like if you have had clots or if you have breast, a history of breast cancer, you know, there's all sorts yeah. of different things to weigh up. But, I mean, one of the um, better news is uh, that they have done some research on the breast cancer like 18 years after the Women's Health Initiative. And in that younger group, there's no increased risk. 
Uh -huh. So in the older group, there absolutely yeah. was. Yeah. But they have published an 18 year follow up study, but unfortunately, they did not have many people in the younger group. Right. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of the questions also about, in a way, kind of asking, you know, how bad does my menopause have to be to seek help? Uh, and people are asking about things like maybe, you know, light, someone said light symptoms like hot flushes. <laughs> That can be pretty devastating, um, you know, cognitive capacity, um, mental and emotional health. You know, again, there's a, 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 I know I'm asking you a really difficult question is how do people no, decide? No, it's an easy question. Uh -huh. uh, if you have any symptoms, you should talk yeah. to your GP. Yeah. That's why right. they're there. They're there to help you yeah. to say, oh, you know, everyone gets that or, or I can give you something else to treat that yeah. or you know, and, and they're there. And of course, they will refer you to endocrinologists who specialise in this area and can yeah. help tailor things for you. Yeah. So just keep asking. A few people were saying, oh, you know, some, some of their GPs maybe were just giving them antidepressants and they felt that that perhaps wasn't cutting the mustard. But uh, well, just keep then, asking. Uh, keep I actually asking. have a chapter. My final, ah. actually, not even a chapter. I snuck it in, Susan. I snuck ah, it in. Um, yeah. <laughs> good. Uh, so, uh, and also, I wasn't allowed to reference in the book, which as an academic, you know, I wanted to reference every sentence. Oh, cutting um, off your arms. references allowed. But then oh. I wrote this uh, extra chapter, fully referenced. <laughs> and they were like, what is this? Uh, so it's an epilogue, but read yeah. the epilogue. So in the okay. epilogue, I actually discuss um, sex, meaning male, female, yes. not gender. Yep. And not other sex. That's in another yep. chapter. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there is an issue around women presenting with symptoms and not people not looking at the etiology of those the same as they do for a man who presents exactly the same age with exactly the same symptoms. So there is something in that. And I, I completely understand uh, where those questions are coming from. Mm -hmm. So I would say you can go and see a specialist in the area. Okay. Um, you know, if you've been to your GP and you're finding that, you know, that you can always get a second opinion and you can go to a, a specialist in the area of women's health and endocrinology. Yeah, great. Okay, there's a very specific one about um, people having hysterectomy. So one question is asked that she had a voluntary hysterectomy at the age of 50. Uh, it's now 10 years and she's still got menopause symptoms. So given your comments earlier about what did you do 10 years after menopause what, what would you be thinking there okay so um i can't give clinical advice no no <laughs> over no, a webinar no no no, no. <laughs> however i would yes. definitely say she should see an endocrinologist and discuss that yeah. and yeah. often when people have hysterectomies young they get given hormone therapy uh -huh. so usually at the time of a hysterectomy if you have a hysterectomy early you know you usually are given hormone therapy and the other thing I should have said when we're talking about hormone therapy is the hormone therapy used in the trial that mm -hmm. we're all scared of was what's called conjugated equine estrogen so it's from horses and there's so many different kinds of estrogens that are all mixed together and that was that estrogen we don't use that anymore so uh -huh. the newer estrogens are synthesized estradiol which is like human estrogen Right. So we've also come a long way, as you'd expect in 20 years, <laughs> in terms of having better therapies in this, this group. Great. Okay. Um, there was also some questions around the impact of hormones um, and maybe even HRT and menopause around mood uh, and uh, the sort of interplay of what people can do you know, about mood and you've touched on this a little bit in terms you know you had some great studies there around depression and uh, mental health so what 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 sort of findings were you coming up with with your cohort around their experiences of changes in mood uh, with menopause yeah so okay i'll take this in three ways yeah <laughs> three I'd answers say, three answers yeah answer one is internationally we know that there's associations with mood, with menopause, with mood, with hormones. And I discussed today mood and diet. You know, yeah. there's, there's absolutely associations with all of these things. And so they all work together. Number two, see an endocrinologist if you're looking for treatment through a hormonal pathway for this, because they're the best to kind of assess that. And number three, our study. <laughs> our study, we actually thought 
oh, we got so many things wrong, so it's, it's embarrassing. We That's thought great. It was, <laughs> it's great research. It's so, so inspiring. We thought, based on the knowledge of many people before us, that as you get older, you would get more depressed because there were so many studies showing the more diseases you have, the more depressed you get. Um, older people suffer depression. If you have loss, you get depressed, so on and so forth. What we did when we looked across 30 years, we were blown away. So for this study, this analysis, we took only the women who came each and every year across two decades, because otherwise the person who was sad and didn't want to come might bias the, the results, right? So these are people who, we didn't lose people who were depressed. It was everyone who came every year. And we found that their chance of being depressed when they came to see us based on clinical scores was less over time. It's actually a graph that goes like this. It's published. <laughs> so they were less depressed over time. We were like, what? Well, this isn't what everyone's saying. What's going on? And we had a look and there's negative mood and positive mood. Now, these women lost partnerships. They lost people they adored. They did have more disease or they were caring for someone they adored who had disease. Um, you know, so they had these negative life events and sure enough, negative mood went up. But positive mood was able to, able to counterbalance that negative mood. And overall, they, on the clinical depression scale, they scored a less likely chance of having depression. Uh -huh. So there's something about uh -huh. the social connections, the positive uh -huh. mood, purpose connection that can bolster you yeah. to suffer the winds of change that life will throw at you. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting because my next question was going to be that somebody did ask about how we can strengthen our emotional well-being as we age, seeing as how life and its events have often taken a toll on our emotional oh. psyche. And I think you've really, really kind of nailed that. So in a way, well, what you're saying add is... To it, add yeah, to it, yeah. sleep. We uh -huh. often don't prioritise sleep. Yeah. So important for mental health Yeah. and brain health. And yeah. I would say we don't know all the great things that sleep do, does at the moment. Yeah. We know that it clears a lot of toxins from our cerebral spinal fluid, which is bathing yeah. the brain and taking away the metabolites. We know it does that. We've seen it. We know that our brain waves are completely different in sleep. Yeah. And as much as the best Dalai Lama meditator can do, they get close to sleep waves, but they're not the same as sleep waves. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, you know, only in sleep do we have those um, different electrical patterns in our brain which we're not entirely sure everything they're doing. We don't know what dreams role specifically has. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I think that, um, you know, sleep we know is important for a number of things, but probably for even more, especially in terms of how we process what's mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Right. And of course we can get help with sleep, with getting advice from GPs. I know here the GPs are getting a lot of education now about how to help people with sleep hygiene and yeah. in my book I actually have a whole section devoted to sleep oh, and fantastic. give some tips yeah. on what you yeah. can do great great yeah that's really 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 important so what I'm hearing is that uh you know we, we might need to be when you say the number one thing is to think about our health is to think about our physical health in that sense of physical activity and diet and sleep but then all those things intersect and we have to think about our mental health so this idea of having a positive mood, um, obviously, have you found, I mean, I was so, totally fascinated that grandparenting has popped up because we, we did a funny little study. Uh, we we um, gave cameras to a whole bunch of people who were in uh, residential care facilities or community facilities, actually, and said, take photos of your definition of well-being. Uh -huh. And uh, I think 75% of the photos were of their grandchildren oh look at that. so when you ask them to people to capture their definition of well-being it was their grandchildren so I think it's really exciting that you've got such a big study where you're listening to people and you can bring these things in I think that's the perfect kind of research isn't it where there's this this connection and, and people's I uh, think Susan yeah that also brings that element of purpose which is yeah. so important for human beings yeah yeah. And it brings in a purpose where sometimes, you know, one of the things in facilities that has the most criticism of facilities is that absence of purpose that people feel. Yeah, yeah. So if you don't have your own grandchildren, maybe you need to go and borrow some. 
Well, look, this is something funny about humanity, isn't it? What do you mean yeah. your own grandchildren? We used to live in communities and some yeah. places around the world, they still do. Yeah. I mean, I have several aunties. One of my aunties is Asian. I mean, I, I yeah. don't think I'm genetically yeah. related to her. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. you know, we really, we should be more community focused and most human beings are. Yeah. Um, it's just the structures yeah. in our lives that have kind of seg segregated yeah. us. Yeah. So these things about kind of exercising our emotional health uh, are obviously important too. So let's, um, you've been so generous with your time, Cassandra. It's been absolutely marvellous to uh, have, have you here. And I'm sure the audience have just got their arms going like this, wanting more and more and more questions. <laughs> I'm so sorry I couldn't be there in person. Uh, I'll come again when they release it. Yes, us. we would love, love to have you. And it, and it is a great read. I really, uh, I have the uh, I have a book here. Oh, and okay. I, uh, I, can, uh, I can attest to that it's a... Look, it's an easy read as well because you make complica complicated science very digestible, but 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 not uh, simplistic. So that's such a, such an art form, I think, to write like that. So I do recommend that. And I'm just thinking, you know, if we can summarize, because so many people want the top tips. So you've given us the top tips about nutrition. Uh, you know what? The, and I really like your analogy about you know the fuel that you put in. You know, we don't put in dirty petrol. We you know um, we you know into our cars. It often occurs to me, we sometimes look after our cars better than we do ourselves. <laughs> um, the other thing that I really has really struck me is that the things that are good for our bodies are good for our minds. So maybe we just need to get rid of this, the thing that they're two separate things. <laughs> I'm sure your researchers are saying that our minds and bodies are so interconnected. Well, look, I think... One of the things that's done, and I know I'm a neurologist, um, but in looking at the Healthy Aging Program, our big focus is multi-morbidity. It's a, it's a buzz term, really means um, there's some, actually, I think it was Australian researchers that did this. They looked at everybody over the age of 50 and they found that they either had no diseases or they had several or more. Uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. So 80% of people like this. So if you're giving a disease-specific, answer to a question you're only targeting 20 percent of people so again going back to being told off we're not answering guidelines <laughs> uh, i think only 12 percent of people comply with guidelines but i'm thinking well if 80 percent of us <laughs> have two or more diseases or none that's actually pretty good i think like we're all complying because <laughs> the proportion yeah. left yeah. who have the one disease probably are complaining but when there's cheeses, it's very hard to kind of nut out sometimes the different yeah. advice that you get. And it's important yeah. we start focusing on um, people as a whole. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. So I've also got here on my notes about physical activity um, and sunshine. I think those two things go quite well, nicely together. But of course, if it's no sun, you can be physically active. Um, I did notice that you said vacuuming. I'm not quite sure that our audience is going to really want to go out vacuuming, but in a well, way, this maybe... is from the 1990s to 2020. So, yes, you know, yes. back yeah, in yeah, the no. 90s, that was yeah. a very big activity. Yeah, yeah. And maybe there's something in it that, you know, when I do go home and, you know, wash my floors, I should actually feel really good about it. Not only do I have clean floors, but I've just done something really good for my brain and my body. How about that? Um, maybe just quickly follow up on that a little bit. How do we improve our HDL, that good cholesterol huh. that you talked about? A complex answer so yeah. what I would say is um, since we did that publication there's actually been several publications showing that in women this high density lipoprotein is this good cholesterol is really important for our sort of heart disease so women uh -huh. have different sort of heart disease to men's heart disease uh, so it looks like it's really important now most of the studies like the the best study for heart disease is a Framingham heart study and that was yeah. 100% male now they have women too now they have women too um, but you know a lot of our research has been in men and this again speaks to the epilogue <laughs> so we really haven't looked at things that are important in women so there aren't actually many medications that can improve HDL but diet and exercise actually does improve your high density lipoprotein would you believe so right. Um, right now that's that's a good area to focus but we right. need a lot more research actually looking at that good okay. cholesterol Okay, good. And controlling blood pressure you mentioned, which is something to talk to your GP about. We've had a great conversation about social engagement. I think that's so such a, a clear set of messages for people. Um, and so really my final comment is uh, what I really enjoyed about your work is 
you're, pre you're presenting aging as a real triumph. You know, so often we're talking about, you know, the, the problems of aging. But what I'm coming away with that, uh, you know, we can age in a very triumphant way. We can really make great choices in our 40s, in our 50s, in our 60s, in our 70s, even in our 80s. It's never too late to do great things uh, and to turn this aging into a set of possibilities to age well uh, and, uh, and, and live younger, which I, I really like that title. That was great. So look, thanks so much. Uh, it's, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. I do encourage people to, uh, to read more in the book. Uh, I think the other thing is uh, it's so exciting that you are engaging with people in research and that it is, there is this reciprocity. And I really encourage people to, to join your studies. Um, of course, here at UniSA, we have a, you know, a lot of uh, nutrition and age-related studies too around physical activity. So please jump on our website. And uh, if you want to physically get involved with studies, we're really always looking for people uh, to engage. We've got some nut studies and some Mediterranean diet studies and so forth. Um, we've also got some studies around uh, you know, chronic management health coaching. So please be in touch. So thanks very much to you, Cassandra. Uh, thanks to the Hawke Centre for the opportunity to bring you over. Thanks to your publishers, University of Melbourne. Uh, and look, we wish you all the best with your work. I think particularly we'd like to wish you all the best in Melbourne. We really feel for you. You know, we, we're not taking our freedoms lightly here in Adelaide and we do really hope that uh, you can, uh, you know, come to some kind of, a, a, you know, health situation where you can... Uh, get out and about and enjoy the freedoms that we have here in a way that's safe. So uh, all the best. Thanks very much, Susan. It's been a real pleasure today.